Hi everyone and welcome to the Roadmap to COP26 closing event. We'll just wait one minute while we have uh, people join the webinar. Okay, we are reaching a critical mass, so we'll get moving on this, the Roadmap to COP26 closing event for London Climate Action Week. Thank you to everyone who's joining us. We've had over 100 people register to join the event, and I can see the numbers filtering into the webinar creeping up very quickly, so thank you very much for joining us. And thank you also to all of the speakers who are joining us today from events that they've hosted throughout London Climate Action Week to talk through how they're seeing the roadmap to COP26 shaping up. Today, of course, we wish we were all in Glasgow together. Before COVID disruption had hit, we would have been in Glasgow taking stock of the action we'd achieved over 2020 at COP26. But alas, that's been moved into next year. Um, and we are instead in the midst of still sort of defining what the roadmap for climate action looks like through this COVID slight chaos. Um, we've had over 60 events on the roadmap to COP26 theme at London Climate Action Week, helping us try to define what this roadmap looks like. And we've seen a lot of the tailwinds being celebrated in these events, tailwinds like the, um, the, the dominoes of net zero falling, the change in US administration and the different politics that that's setting up and the different geopolitics that's setting up and the hope for a return to a multilateral approach from, from the US. But we've also um, seen events pointing to some of the headwinds that continue to exist. And we've had a whole other theme of events looking at the question of a better recovery and how do we manage the economic and health and social crises that COVID is, um, is posing in a way that also rebuilds back greener and fairer and more resilient. We've had a few references to uncertainty in some of the other events. Lots of them have dived into the detail on specific policy areas, things, questions of, of NDCs, how do we drum up ambition around 2030 nationally determined contributions, um, and also questions of specific economic sector transformations. How do we transform the energy sector? How do we transform land use or transport sectors? And these are really parts of building that roadmap to COP26. What I think we haven't quite got out of, of, of some of the events so far is how all of the different pieces fit together into a cohesive roadmap for the next 12 months so that we're maximizing the action that we get out of the international system, out of countries, out of cities, subnationals, and, and the private sector over the next 12 months. So that's what we're here to do today in our London Climate Action Week Roadmap to COP26 closing event is bring together some of the speakers from different events to give us their snippets on how that roadmap is shaping up. We also want to involve all of you who are joining us for this webinar. So we have a few different ways for you to interact in this session. The first will be a Jamboard that we're using to try and collate from everyone what they're seeing as the priorities for this roadmap over the next six months to deliver. So Tom is posting into the chat. You will be able to find the link to this Jamboard. It's an online um, brainstorming tool where you will be able to add your thoughts on what should be the benchmarks or what should be the main priorities that we're pushing on the advocacy and the diplomacy side, non-state actors, civil society and governments to drive out of the next 12 months please do add your thoughts in there. And there are some instructions on the second page on this Jamboard link. Um, and the other way that we'd like to get you involved is after we've had some short snippets from each of our panelists, we will be bringing together a discussion. So we'd love you to add your questions into the Q&A function in Zoom. The Q&A function has been enabled um, so that you can comment on each other's questions and you can upvote on each other's questions. So please do 
um, interact with each other on there. We won't unfortunately be able to get to every question in the mix. So, so please do interact with each other um, there as well. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panel. We'll be running through two different um, panels of speakers first this morning. Our first one is a panel on policy. And we'll have three speakers with us here. We'll have Kelly Levin, Senior Associate at WRI, giving us a, a perspective on mitigation and climate finance. How is that roadmap shaping up over the next year? Then we'll have Ita Kettlebrook, Deputy Director of the Energy Transitions Commission, who will be speaking on green recovery and net zero and how that fits into the roadmap for the next year to COP26. And then we'll close that session with Vanessa perez Terrera who is the Deputy Leader um, of Global Climate and Energy at WWF, who will be speaking particularly on adaptation, resilience and nature. So I'd like to first hand over to Kelly Levin from WRI, who will give us her take on where the roadmap is heading on mitigation and climate finance. Kelly, over to you. Terrific, thanks. and. Uh... Um, wonderful to be with you. Thanks so much to the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, London Climate Action Week has been really a tremendous showcase of the latest action and findings in the climate community, and it's been a real privilege to be part of it. And amazing what we can pull off from all corners around the globe, bringing us together under these circumstances. Um, just to step back, we know that the latest signs suggest to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, emissions need to drop by half by 2030 and reach net zero by mid-century. And the question is, are we on track? Yesterday, uh, we released with Climate Works uh, a report that assesses progress on 21 indicators across six key sectors important for achieving 2030 and 2050 targets. The benchmarks were designed by the Climate Action Tracker in WRI. And as illustrated by this slide, um, we looked at 21 indicators and only two show a historical rate of change that is sufficient to meet both 2030 and 2050 targets, but only if that rate of change is sustained, which is no small task. And there's significant regional variation that's, that's masked here. 13 of the indicators that we assessed show change headed in the right direction, but um, too slowly, and some that are off by a very large factor, and you can see here the acceleration factor that's needed to show change headed in the wrong direction altogether. And for four of them, data were incomplete to assess progress. Uh, we know that the required transformations are a major department departure from our current pace of progress. And, while this does seem daunting for sure, we also know it's technically achievable. If you think to the technological advances we've seen with cars and phones and computers, uh, it once seemed impossible. And we do know that a rapid transition to a zero carbon future offers the same opportunity, but only if properly nurtured with the right policies and incentives and investments. Um, Ahead of COP26 climate negotiations next year, countries are going to need to submit much stronger national climate commitments in the form of NDCs for 2030, develop long-term strategies for mid-century, meaningful net zero targets that are also coupled with short-term commitments. We're already seeing some very um, good momentum to that, uh, which is gonna be essential to maintain. We have 15 countries that have already submitted a revised NDC. 19 countries that have submitted their first LTS, 25 countries in the EU have committed to a net zero emission target in law or policy and over 100 have aspirations to do so. And depending on how ambitious forthcoming commitments are, those national plans could either lock us into a carbon intensive trajectory or accelerate us towards a safer, prosperous and more equitable future. We also know that in addition, the rapid transition needed will require significant financial investments, technology transfer, capacity building for a developing country. Our report shows that with there's a very small carbon budget left by mid-century if we are to meet our climate goals. And um, there's really tremendous conver convergence among countries in terms of their emission trajectories. So it necessitates much more support. Um, while climate finance has increased significantly in recent years, it is definitely not at the scale needed to revolutionize our energy and transport systems, protect our forests. If you look at the energy system alone, 
Estimates indicate that between 1.6 and $3.8 trillion per year will be needed through 2050, and that's just the energy system. And in addition, despite a growing number of commitments, only about half of major private sector banks have sustainable finance commitments, and many are still investing more in fossil fuels than they are in a sustainable finance, including those with commitments. So when we think about what are the asks for next year and what's the roadmap for delivering it, there are a few different tracks we'll be looking at. First, there are the moments leading up to COP26 and the intense diplomacy that's gonna occur over the coming months. We have um, anticipate some new announcements that are gonna be made over December 12th, the five-year anniversary event that's organized by the COP26 presidency. And there are other events throughout the year, various summits. We need to make sure we keep this drumbeat going to make sure that there are opportunities for countries to bring much greater ambition in the context of NDCs, long-term strategies, net zero targets that are tied to short-term action and that these countries are celebrated when doing so. And a second track is the cities and businesses and other non-state and subnational actors that have been stepping up to bolster and encourage national ambition, taking action in their own right. We've seen year on year growth in the number of commitments being made, many commitments being more ambitious than national counterparts. And over the course of the next year, the, champion, the champions are bringing together sectors to advance movement. There also needs to be um, alignment of financial flows with the Paris Agreement. And this includes the MDBs, making sure that they're fully aligned with the Paris Agreement, not investing in fossil fuels, uh, the mandatory application of climate risk reporting for banks and investors and companies. And lastly, there's the official multilateral process itself. COP26 has to lay the groundwork for the next round of ratcheting up ambition, showing that the Paris Agreement mechanism does work establishing common timeframes, informing the global stock take. And it's also going to be essential to get an outcome around finance as well. Key priorities are taking stock of the progress towards the $100 billion goal, beginning negotiations on a new collective climate finance goal to be agreed before 2025. And as recent reports show, more climate finance is needed to meet that $100 billion goal. And in the backdrop of all of this activity is the recovery to COVID-19 and whether countries around the world will prioritize investments rather than that facilitate rather than hinder a more sustainable, equitable future. So just thank you very much, Kelly. Um, okay, thank was, you. That was fantastic. And, and that's a great segue into our next speaker as well, Aita from uh, the Energy Transitions Commission, who's going to pick up this thread that you've just started for us on the green recovery and how that weaves into that excellent roadmap that you started to map out for us through some of the climate commitments that we want from countries, the finance shifts that we need to see the money flowing into implementing them and to enabling vulnerable countries to, to do the same. And where does the green recovery fit within that, within that trajectory and across the moments um, over the next year? Aita, over to you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, it's great to be here with you today reflecting. Um, there have been some very powerful discussions this week. Uh, some of the particular highlights, um, the, the path to global alignment at COP26 with the UK and Italian uh, government COP26 teams, some of the examples of London taking a lead on climate action. So the learnings from the BEDZ zero carbon development in South London and the 50 London businesses that committed to net zero in the lead up to the Climate Action Week, and also corporate actions, so the launch of the PCAF Global Carbon Accounting Standards. So measurement and reporting of greenhouse gases associated with lending and investment, really critical uh, to have those standards to enable that those movements in finance that Kelly just talked about. So some really interesting and exciting conversations. Um, at the Energy Transitions Commission, we're, we're a global coalition of industry and NGO leaders from across the energy landscape committed to achieving net zero by mid-century. Um, and at the, the, the uh, Energy Transitions Commission, we're absolutely confident that a net zero global economy is technically and economically possible by mid-century. The technologies and business solu solutions needed, many of which mapped out by Kelly's slide, um, are already available or are close to being bought from to market, we don't have to wait for a breakthrough. And while investment is large in absolute terms, they're also manageable in the context of global GDP, you know, one and a half percent, et cetera, uh, uh, example of, of global GDP. And this 
Net zero economy will require a profound transformation of the global energy system, massive increase in the role of clean electricity, with most coming from clean, uh, zero carbon uh, wind and solar, uh, role for hydrogen, limited use of sustainable biomass, fossil fuels and CCS, dramatic improvements of energy efficiency, really fundamental transformation. So to deliver those mid-century targets, we need to put ourselves on the trajectory now. We need to progress massive acceleration in proven low carbon solutions, most crucially uh, renewable power. We need to create the right policy and investment environment for the diffusion of existing low carbon technologies like hydrogen. So removing fossil fuel subsidies, raising carbon prices, standards, regulations. And we also need to bring to market the next wave of zero carbon technologies for harder to abate sectors, particularly, for example, in aviation. And as you've said, COVID is now a reality. We must take these actions in that COVID reality. We need to ensure that the investment in economic recovery is also an investment in the economy of the future because there isn't the time or the money for it not to be. And this was the call our commissioners made back in May while they highlight, when they highlighted that seven priorities to help the global economic recovery while also bringing, uh, building a net zero economy. And this is really focusing of those elements of the transition um, which can underpin new jobs, Crucially, the massive investments in, zero, in renewable power systems, which will require investment across supply chains from manufacturing to installation, providing lots of opportunities for jobs. There's also the investments in green buildings, retrofits, new builds and green infrastructure, which can boost the construction sector. And that is often local around the country. So boosting it in a distributive manner. So just coming back to what does this mean for COP26, we see two priorities. Uh, Kelly has, has uh, shadowed me very much here. Um, on the countryside, there is, of course, the, the official negotiations and crucially, um, the translation of this growing uh, global momentum towards net zero into more ambitious commitments within the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions. But really, alongside that, we need the real economy to step up. We must have corporates making similar commitments to actions alongside countries. In terms of what do we really think is, in, is um, important to deliver that, Three areas I wanted to highlight uh, in this brief, brief uh, uh, session. First, the continued drumbeat of commitments to uh, inc help encourage more uh, uh, ambitious NDCs. So from corporates, large and small, and really important that we bring the SME community into uh, the uh, net zero commitments uh, from regions, from cities, uh, building that momentum, sustaining the momentum we've seen this year, and also demonstrating crucially demonstrating to policymakers that there is broad support for action. Um, secondly, we think it's very important that we continue to provide governments with the confidence that net zero is feasible. And this is really where the ETC has historically focused. It's about demonstrating to countries and to governments how net zero can be achieved across sectors of the economy, bringing industry back to evidence and uh, assign, um, academic back to evidence that it, of what is possible and helping countries to identify the priority areas for progress, the, the areas I discussed before. And for the real economy, we really think that it's critical over the next year and beyond, but for corporates to collaborate across their value chains and with the finance sector to map the sector pathways towards a net zero transition and then start taking those concrete, concrete steps on the journey that we want to be able to reference and see by COP26. So that's making investments in the technology of the future, setting targets and milestones, and finally working with governments where that's needed to enable progress, for, for example, through setting, tar use, working with governments to set appropriate targets and mandates. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Aita. Very, very great to have you bring in that non-state actor corporate uh, contribution and mapping out how though that they can help build that momentum throughout the year, adding to the pressure across the moments of the roadmap to COP26 to bed in that net zero, not just in targets, but also in the policy and the implementation, including through the way governments are spending their, their recovery packages and, and, and subnational spending their recovery packages. Thank you very much for that. We're now going to turn to Vanessa perez Chirera from WWF, who will bring us her perspectives on the issues of adaptation, resilience, and nature, and where the roadmap is, is 
firming up around, around those particular policy areas. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for the London Climate Action Week for the for the invite and the great uh, the great week. So the pandemic has not made the climate crisis go away. Um, approximately one billion people fa face high risks to their safety and welfare from the adverse impacts of climate change. Already, more than one hundred million people need life saving assistance every year. These people, the ones that are at highest risk, are also the low income communities that that rely on local natural resource systems, both for their livelihoods as well as for their climate resilience. These natural systems are being lost at an unprecedented rate. This trend not only contributes to climate change, but is magnified by, by its impact. So what, what have I learned this week? Um, from the NDC submitted to the UN so far, adaptation and resilience is gaining importance in enhancing disease, mostly from the developing countries. However, we need the same from developed countries, including international adaptation support to the South in nature-based solutions that privilege uh, the most vulnerable. Many events on nature-based solutions have highlighted their value both for mitigation, but also for adaptation and resilience. And we have highlighted as well the complementarity and need of profound decarbonization measures needed in all sectors. So meaning these are not uh, substitutes. Nature-based solutions deliver more jobs per dollar, higher income returns, and are faster to implement than conventional recovery actions. They must be a fundamental part of nature and climate positive recovery. So what is my, our top ask for COP26? One of the most important outcomes of the Paris Agreement was to put adaptation and mitigation on equal footing, but we still often overlook adaptation on this course and action. COP26 should profile adaptation and mitigation. One and one way of doing that is recognizing the value of nature-based solutions for adaptation in the decision text, including a range of ecosystems, a readiness mechanism for nature-based solutions and an oceans program. So what do I think is the roadmap for delivering it? What should happen? Um, first of all, I think we need uh, clear and ambitious commitments in the Paris Agreement birthday in the Climate Ambition Summit hosted by the, by the UK government on the 12th of December. Um, government, governments, particularly nor northern developed countries, must announce substantially enhancing NDCs on both mitigation and adaptation and a, net, and a, and a clear way to avoid trade-offs. Climate smart nature-based solutions for adaptation need to be fully integrated into national adaptation plans. So the value of nature and its also needed resilience is not overlooked. G20 countries should take the lead on climate and nature positive recovery. At the moment, 16 of the G20 economies have um, stimulus packages that are having or expected to have a negative impact on the environment. All of them should be going to the green quadrant of the Vivid Economic Index. We need strong commitments from public and private finance. These could include from the private sector, um, 5 trillion or so committed to conversion-free portfolios, uh, ecosystem conversion-free portfolios. On the private side, at least 25% of the perverse subsidies realigned to nature-based solutions or climate positive investments. It is uh, estimated by the OECD that from the total amount of fossil fuel subsidies, only 25% would actually cover for the on, you know, for the big for the gap in finance that we have on the on the national um, natural protected uh, systems um, uh, networks. So in summary, governments must rise to meet and embrace the great non-state actors ambitions that we have heard this week and step up their climate uh, commitments in partnership with also the finance sector um, and the civil society. So thank you very much, Alex. Thanks very much, Vanessa. And it's, it's great to see um, some common themes coming through from the speakers so far, both recognizing the scale of the challenge, but also the technical and economic feasibility of, of meeting it. Um, on the trajectory to net zero towards COP26. And we've had some key themes coming out on the what's on this uh, COP26 roadmap so far. Clearly targets from countries on NDCs and net zero long-term strategies, but also from non-state actors, one of the major what's, delivering them by 
uh, by uh, moving recovery funds into economic sector transformation, as well as nature-based solutions. Accelerating that finance shift out of fossils into clean, but also scaling up the amount of finance available for developing countries to transition and deal with climate impacts. And then also profiling adaptation coming through strongly as one of the major priorities for what this roadmap should be delivering. We're all clearly in, when we look to the how and the processes, we're all clearly looking to the 12th of December to deliver some big steps forward on NDCs in particular. Then we're looking for the non-state actor community to scale up their commitments to build the momentum throughout the year, as well as gathering commitments from public and private finance and those then being matched by governments throughout the year, as well as seeing the G20 take the lead. So great to see that roadmap starting to shape up already. We're now moving rapidly into our next panel, where we'll have three more speakers bringing us a political perspective on what they've learned from London Climate Action Week um, events over the week and how they're seeing the politics and the geopolitics shaping up along this roadmap to COP26, um, as well as some of the priorities from different sectors, including, including young people. Um, we'll also, we'll, we'll have for this session, Isabel Hilton speaking first, who is the editor of China Dialogue and brought us some incredible events looking at the geopolitical relationships between China, the EU and, and the US and how that's shaping up next year. We'll have Josh Trugale, who's been the event coordinator for the COP, which is still ongoing at the moment. So really looking forward to hearing Josh's perspective on how he's seeing the influence, um, how, how young people, sorry, are trying to influence the politics of COP26 and how they're seeing the next year shape up. And then we'll turn to Nick Bridge, uh, the UK's special representative on climate change at the FCDO, who will reflect on what the speakers have brought to us today on their roadmap to COP26 and give us a UK perspective on how they're shaping up their diplomatic advocacy plans for the next year. So let's turn first to Isabel Hilton of China Dialogue to give us her perspective, particularly on the geopolitics of climate change over the next 12 months. Isabel, over to you. Many thanks, Alex. And, um, and many thanks to E3G um, for all the energy and commitment of London Climate Action Week. Uh, we were asked what what we learned this week, one of the things I learned is that the next time I need to take a week off so that I can catch up with all the amazing events rather than uh, spending the day thinking, oh, God, I missed another one. Um, the second big lesson, though, is uh, slightly more sobering, is, is that although in important ways this is a much more hopeful moment than just a year ago, nevertheless, this is not the world of 2015. And multilateralism is in a very fragile state after four years of Trump and eight years of Xi Jinping. The UNFCCC is a multilateral process, as we know, and it's in better shape than some other bits of the machine, but we can't take anything for granted. Um, I think global governance is overall highly stressed and the aftermath of the pandemic is not going to help. So we have these contradictory trends. The climate perspective is pretty positive. Um, the geopolitical perspective is pretty negative and success at COP26 and keeping this show on the road will depend on many things, but high on my list is managing the interaction between the major players in geopolitics and the major players in climate, and they are the same powers. So in our two events this week, we looked at, at this triangle that accounts for nearly 60% of global emissions. So China, 37%, the EU, 7%, and the US, 14%. Um, it is increasingly the judgment of OECD countries that China joining the world has not so far made China conform to global rules so much as uh, having China put its effort into changing global rules to conform to China's needs. Um, and that includes conforming to everything that the CCP needs uh, to ensure that it stays in power. And this is causing a lot of friction in what were previously relatively harmonious relationships between China's partners and the People's Republic. So China is trying to change the kind of scaffolding of multilateralism to suit its, its needs better. Um, and as the US staggers out of four years of Trump, where does the imperative to cooperate on climate fit into this? And from what we 
learned this week, I think despite Trump's imminent departure, this triangle of geopolitical tensions between the US, China and the EU are really critical complications and they have the potential to damage uh, progress on climate action at a time when we really need to move uh, forward much more rapidly as we've just heard than we are doing. So on the positive side, Xi Jinping's September announcement of a, of a 2060 target, yes, it's a game changer. Biden's election, yes, that's a game cha changer. And the important shifts in market sentiment that I think we've seen in the last two, three years are also key elements. 126 countries committed to net zero and so on. So, so the question is how to get there, given that we have this, this moment in which there is greater energy, greater perspective, and, and an opportunity that these, um, that these uh, uh, developments have, uh, have offered. And uh, on the list of negatives that we have to circumvent in order to continue with a forward motion, I would include the fact that Biden will find it very difficult to reverse the trade wars, though he might perhaps be able to manage a more intelligent approach uh, to the US-China trade wars. Um, these continuing geostrategic rivalries in the Indo-Pacific, they won't diminish, especially given China's increasingly belligerent tone and the tensions between the EU and China that include unresolved trade and investment conflicts, level playing field concerns, state subsidies, intellectual property, market access, systemic rivalry, reservations over the Belt and Road. Uh, these aren't going to change any more than the all round tensions about human rights abuses in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and suspicions over China's approach to the EU, including rival fora such as 17 plus one. So these are symptoms of intractable issues. There is a systemic conflict, uh, and and China is not going to level the playing field without extremely unlikely radical reform at home. It's it's frankly implausible, and so it is therefore quite plausible that we'll see a return of of things like anti-dumping disputes of a kind we saw over solar panels across a range of low carbon technologies as China fights for a dominant market share. And that will include the fight to set the technology standards of the future, including in low carbon technologies. Now, most of these questions won't be explicitly on the table at COP26, but they will be very much in the room. So my top ask for COP26 is that the leaders of the US, China and the EU, along with the UK, don't allow geostrategic complications to become climate distractions or worse and that they and that these tensions which we have to live with can be channeled into a race to the top somehow to produce the most ambitious NDCs that really map out the pathways to net zero and in China's case particularly robust action before 2030 uh, which so far is a little bit still in doubt in the US case as good an NDC as it it can in the UK case, well, come on, I think we can do better than we have so far. So my roadmap, we need to be extremely aware of the dangers and I respectfully encourage the UK to be extremely climate proactive in every forum and every meeting between now and the COP. It needs to be integrated into every summit, every high level meeting, including on trade, finance and security. And from now on, any closing communique that does not include climate is just irrelevant. There needs to be proactive diplomacy over the contentious non-climate geostrategic issues in the coming year. They won't be resolved, as I say, but perhaps they can be contained enough to avoid cross-contamination of the climate talks. The United States needs to catch up with the conversation and understand that if it continues to fail to direct resources towards future technologies, it's simply going to lose the race and China will enjoy not only a short term advantage, but the longer term advantage that has been that will be associated with standard setting. And it has been putting a lot of effort into achieving that long term advantage for at least a decade. So it, it really is time for the US to refocus its climate conversation away from uh, away from fear, away from the, the narrative of loss and into the narrative um, of opportunity. Again, climate change needs to be integrated into every sector and every ministry in every country 
uh, include as well as into every international conversation. There isn't a clear global leader anymore in this, but there will be different leaders in different sectors, and these sectoral leaders will be very important. And given the economic damage that COVID has done and will continue to do, it's essential, as others have said, that climate change be the baseline consideration of recovery programs, which so far it is not. There's a risk. Thank you. Given one last point. Yeah. Sorry, I will stop. Uh, China's national that. mood. Uh, I think China needs to understand that it, if it narrows the ground for Western politicians with continuing belligerence, then it is damaging climate prospects. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Isabel. Sincerely appreciate the, the clear challenges that you've set out that we still face, and particularly how some of the diplomatic actions from some of those key players that you mentioned could help to manage some of those tensions throughout the year. We're now going to turn to Josh Tregale to give us his perspective as a coordinator of Mock COP and youth engagement around the COP processes and climate action, how you are seeking to influence the politics of COP26 and where you're seeing the youth perspectives on the roadmap for the year. Josh, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to to have um, young people being able to be represented at, at things like this. So we're, we're really grateful. Um, so yeah, like like Alex said, um, Mock COP is something that's happening at the moment, and it's effectively a youth led version of COP26. So all of the delegates are young people, all of the organisers are also young people. And it started yesterday, and we've got over 330 young people from 100 over 140 countries. We're going to be working together to come up with a global statement similar to how COP would have been. I think really from the point of view of young people, nothing much has changed in the way that we do communication. Um, young people have been using the internet for a long time. Climate activism from young people has for a long time been solely online. We don't have in-person meetings. So I think from the point of view of us, there hasn't been much change in terms of climate activism. Obviously, we haven't been able to attend strikes and protests. And, and we've sort of moved online to, to sort of campaigning and, and policy. Um, so when it comes to, to Mock COP, the idea really is that we represent what young people think when it comes to climate change. And at the end of Mock COP, which will be the 1st of December, there'll be a statement produced that will be a high level statement on behalf of the youth of the world to the political world leaders. And the idea for that is that over the next year up until COP26, young people are able to talk to their leaders, talk to their COP delegations about what we've concluded, about what ideas have been put forward, so about the solutions, and the refocusing of the conversation. I think for young people, um, we would like the conversation around climate change to be widened. Um, we want the impact that it has on people to really be thought about, rather than just solely looking at numerical targets to think of it as human lives. I mean, we, we see all the time the impact that climate change has on people. Um, so for Mock COP, one of the key themes is, is the human impact, particularly in the Global South. So we've made a few changes to the way that the conference works. Um, we've got more delegates from the Global South and from the Global North to try and refocus where that conversation lies. We want for the people to have uh, the most voice if they're the people most affected by climate change rather than those who are causing climate change to just sort of rebalance that conversation. And there's that, that sort of international sense of unity. I think throughout the pandemic, it's really drawn people together. Um, so I, I think from the point of view of young people, we'd really like to, to build on that. So our roadmap for the year ahead really is that um, the outcomes that we see from Mock COP, the outcomes that we see from um, the 12th of December announcements, that we can really build and work with world leaders and with our representatives in our own countries to, to talk to them about climate change and why young people particularly feel so strongly about it. Um, I, I really liked actually something that Vanessa said. She said, COVID-19 has not made the climate crisis go away. Um, and I think that's really that young people want to continue that pressure. We want to continue having that conversation when it comes to climate change to make sure that it isn't forgotten about and we don't get distracted. I think that's really probably the key reason that Mock COP started was to try and fill that void left behind to try and kickstart that conversation, but to illustrate what would happen if young people were in charge rather than world leaders so i think our big asks are that um world leaders look at the statement we produce and that when it comes to cop 26 next year the ambition is raised um young people want more ambition when it comes to climate change and that's our big ask it'd be great if young people were able to be parts of some of the delegations when it comes to cop 26 
to really push some of that ambition. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, really wonderful to have your perspectives shared and we all look forward to reading the statement that you build together out of the, the mock cup. Can't wait to see how that comes together. We're now going to hand over to Nick Bridge, the UK's special rep representative on climate change to reflect on some of the learnings from London Climate Action Week that have been shared by our speakers so far and the roadmaps that they've presented towards COP26. Um, and give us a sense of the UK's roadmap for the next 12 months. Nick, over to you. Thanks so much. And thanks E3G and, and everybody who's been participating and engaging this week. It's been a brilliant, uh, brilliant week of events and a great flavor and summary from all the previous speakers. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll start straight where Josh uh, left off, which is, you know, for me, uh, the biggest shift um, for us as, Government's the biggest positive shift in the last couple of years has been the way that the youth um, voice has been able to break through. And that's obviously, you know, just beginning. It's got to be locked in in the ways that Josh described. I, I love these ideas uh, of setting up the mock cop with, you know, the disproportionate weighting of the voices of those affected most and, and, and the voice of the global south. And all of those ideas are great. And it was great that the COP president designate was, was there to open up the mock cop and, and, and hear those voices so the the youth voices really shifted the debate as we've all seen and that's got to carry on and then to lift secondly off um perhaps what isabel was saying and i completely you know take uh, and, and note carefully you know all the sort of geopolitical um dynamics that isabel set out um and i suppose i, I mean i'm neither an optimist or a pessimist but what, what i might usefully do is just I mean, she touched on some of this, but in turn, turn that around a bit uh, and start to think about the uh, diplomacy that, that uh, I and others are, are doing intensively and think about sort of stepping back in the bigger picture here that, that was coming through in Isabel's remarks was that if you actually look at economic self-interest, uh, environmental realities, uh, biodiversity and climate change, if you look at what's best for societies and livable cities and, and, and functioning communities, if you look at what's best for financial stability, if you look at what's best for uh, global security, in, in, including in vulnerable and failing states, all of those things point to uh, accelerated climate action at scale. Climate action is good for all of those things and those all things that governments care about. The dynamic, however, is that there are many other factors in play, and Isabel outlined uh, some of them that, 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 that push back against that, uh, certainly in, in the near term. So certainly, I hope that the now really thoughtful strategy that we've put together with inputs from literally hundreds of quarters, uh, sort of as the COP president designate, is to take you know, what was locked in uh, intergovernmentally in Paris, accept that the politics you know, is very challenging uh, since then, but that the economics has continued to really transform. And so to harness all of those dynamics that are in all countries' self-interest and use those to create a narrative around more rapid change at scale of the sort that we all know uh, that we need to see. So um, that uh, you know, is, is where the strategy, I won't go into in detail, there's not time, but around our emphasis on the themes of energy, and the transition of energy uh, around nature and, and forestry and sustainable food systems and land use, around transport. These are all the areas that have got to really transform in, uh, and, and we are getting fantastic commitments coming forward. There's then the underpinning themes of adaptation and resilience. We completely hear that voice coming out about just how much we've got to put this at the center. If we don't show countries that the support and the technical and financial support is coming forward, and getting into the right places, then we can't succeed. And the other underpinning thing around finance and greening finance and greening the whole financial system to get investment into the right uh, places. So we have those themes and we need to now overlay those into the geopolitics. And um, you know, it is in, in, you know, very encouraging, obviously what we've seen from the Chinese commitment and then the Japanese and then the Korean uh, and then the changes in the US. Uh, but also what a previous comment, commentator said about all levels of government. I, I've described how we're moving from a sort of governmental focus to all of society 
focus and drawing in people's economic and environmental and social self-interest, but also all levels of government, whether it be cities, communities, local governments, states, and just using all levers. We have a really powerful race to zero narrative going on in the business community to make, make, make sure that they have science-based targets, they have uh, NDCs um, and so on. And so um, th 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 that's, that's the sort of the philosophy. We're putting a huge diplomatic uh, effort into this. We've got the biggest network in the world of climate diplomats, every ambassador, every high commissioner, the Foreign Secretary is uh, on to this every day and making calls and all ministers are active. As Isabel says, we again, we need to lock this into every process. We've got a very fortuitous set of milestones, the G7 and then the G20 with our Italian partners uh, in, in, in COP, um, but also the Commonwealth heads of government. The, we need to really harness the International Financial Institution meetings in spring and in, in autumn. Uh, we have um, all sorts of other events around adaptation and resilience. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, you know, we've really now got to drive this home, um, get this into leaders uh, in boxes across all of their agendas. And so uh, that's the plan. Look forward to going into the panel discussion to sort of get some challenge on that and, and get a sense of how people think that is going. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, greatly appreciate you setting out a bit of a diplomatic roadmap from the UK's perspective there. And great to hear you bring up the, the G7 in particular. I think some of the questions that we've had coming through are reflecting on the role of the G7 and perhaps also the nature, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity COP as two other moments in the roadmap over the next year. And I would be grateful to hear some um, thoughts from our panel on where they're seeing the links from the uh, UNFCCC or the climate change agenda into that nature agenda, and also what the role of the G7 might be, particularly next year. Could we turn first perhaps to Vanessa, um, particularly from that, that nature and climate perspective? So thank you, Alex. I, I think that the climate and nature nexus is being is is as clear as 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 ever. Uh, if you talk to a to a young person, uh, that young person it will say, I'm, I'm fighting for the planet. Uh, they're actually not making the, the difference anymore. Um, and I think that is that is great. I mean, we have very particular challenges on the on, on decarbonizing the energy sector, of course, but but it's all for the same uh, for the same mission, right? Um, so, what what do I I think we have to have uh, by uh, by COP twenty six, and um, and how the roadmap looks like in general? I think one, I mean, three things. One is to finalize ongoing mandates of key importance are common timeframes and a robust Article 6 that accounts for environmental integrity. Um, I think a Glasgow type platform to accelerate implementation would be key. So the, the UK presidency is caring a lot about the roadmap to COP26, but I think it's also starting to care very much about uh, what happens after COP26. So what is the roadmap that we uh, lie uh, ahead of that? And then a strong and attractive non-state actors agenda for systemic change moving forward and how that really connects to government uh, uh, ambition. How, how can we help as, as WWF in this, in this roadmap? Uh, we have uh, NDCs we want guidelines uh, to benchmark countries and guide them. Uh, we have uh, programs in more than 60 countries, so we are ready to work hand in hand with, uh, with governments. And then finally, uh, we are active members of the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And so I think that as we move forward, we need science-based net, net zero targets that ensure a 1.5 degree pathway as the basis, and then for to go on further ambition uh, to, for investments in robust nature-based solutions, um, uh, investments uh, 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 on the ground that are good for both people and, and nature. Thank you, Alex. Great, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from Isabel as well, particularly on the links into the, the CBD COP15 agenda. Isabel, over to you. Thanks, Alex. And, and thanks, Vanessa, for um, raising the question of, of nature-based solutions and the links between the CBD COP15, which was to have happened uh, by now actually in Kunming uh, and is now postponed to next year. China is leading and hosting that. 
Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure we've all read uh, the 1.5 uh, assessments and, and the, we understand the difference between 1.5 and 2 and even at 1.5 what havoc is going to be wreaked on nature by by climate change particularly you know in terms of 90 percent of the world's corals and so on so I won't rehearse that except to say that the crisis in nature is at least as urgent and and closely related to the crisis in climate and unfortunately the process of the CBD is pretty weak and so far unconvincing as far as Kunming goes. And that's partly down to China's uh, leadership uh, in slightly in air quotes, which, which largely consists of setting low ambition so something gets achieved rather than setting the high ambition that's required. And we're looking at you know, a decade, the next decade of commitments, all the previous decades commitments were missed. So, so it is, it's a crisis, not just of nature, but it's a crisis of process. And we all devote a great deal of attention rightly to COP26 and perhaps a little less to the, to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this is the year in which they really were to be linked because the, the mutual benefits of linking them and having as robust a process in the CBD are now very clear. We haven't really made it. And so again, attention to that is is pretty critical and any support that can be given to sharpen up uh, the Chinese notion of what it takes to host a CBD, which right now, as I say, is pretty unconvincing, would be welcome. Thanks, Isabel. Um, I think that's a really effective challenge to the other players in the diplomatic space um, as well. I'd like to, uh, because we're short on time, I think we could, we could dive into this um, question of the nature climate nexus and whether processes join up next year in a lot more detail. But let's, uh, given time, move to the G7 agenda in particular and where, where we think there's a role for the G7 on this roadmap to COP26. And I'd like to bring in Kelly um, in particular to give us a, a thought on what priority the G7 could be delivering for us on this roadmap next year, Kelly? Sure, sure, thanks. I mean, I, I think we could see a real reinvigoration of the role of the G7 in advancing climate action, um, especially in light of the US election. Um, Biden has already pledged to bring the leaders of major emitters together and um, it, it certainly, I think, re-injects a new enthusiasm around climate action in the G7, in the G20, and the North American Leadership Summit. Um, and I think it could be a new stage of international cooperation on climate change. Um, and, and then you see action of other key G7 players, most notably uh, the recent announcement yesterday out of Canada for legislation around net zero. Um, so we're starting to see some real momentum. Um, and you know, as it is up to the G7 um, really to also demonstrate tremendous leadership um, here, given uh, the outsize impact on emissions um, and coupled with uh, the net zero announcements that are coming up and hopefully strengthen NDCs in the next few months, um, hoping that this really can be a, a real milestone on the journey towards COP26. Thanks, Kelly. Definitely um, hoping for that milestone to, to ring true. I think um, where we are in the agenda, we want to save some minutes at the end to bring in um, particularly another question that's come up around the risk of tight donor budgets um, and impeding the COVID recovery and, um, and the support that's been given to vulnerable countries. So we'll bring in Nick maybe uh, just a minute to give us a bit of a sum up between all of the interventions we've had from our speakers today, some of the comments that have come through in the chat and his perspectives on that question in particular. But before we do, let's check in very quickly with Tom Evans from the E3G team, who's been watching the jam board as you've all been participating in it um, throughout, throughout the, the discussion so far. Tom, could you give us a quick one minute plug on, on what we're seeing as the London Climate Action Week community's priorities for this roadmap next year. 
Certainly. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it's, we've had some interesting responses. I think one of the ones which has really popped out to me off the back of kind of that G7 and the kind of the broader G20 question is a point that's been made around ending fossil fuel subsidies. And I think that's a really important point to kind of remind, especially in the context of uh, the Biden election and the Biden victory. And of course, um, fossil fuel subsidies being kind of an ongoing debate in the Democrat Party there. So I think that'll be one to watch for sure. And I think another really interesting one, which I'm definitely wanting to kind of pay more attention to next year is um, someone's made a point about a robust commitment to support urban resilience. And I think that's interesting. Earlier this morning, we were um, hosting an event on the kind of the G20 priorities. And I think the Italian G20 were very much pointing to kind of urban centers and urban kind of nature as um, the kind of a key focus for them. And, and, and certainly given kind of urbanization trends is a, key, is a key focus for many people. So I think that was a very interesting point. Um, yeah, I mean, it's good to see kind of some of the bigger points around um, the need to kind of focus on jobs and livelihoods and that, that importance right now in, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the need to make sure that um, everything we do on climate change really delivers for people's livelihoods and people's jobs. It's a very difficult time. Um, and then finally, yeah, just an interesting point around um, local energy strategies. And I don't think that's something we've touched on too much today, but certainly other events at Elcor have. Um, and yeah, the need to kind of see, see things at the local level and what community energy looks like. And I know that was a big theme running through the Net Zero London theme during, during this Elcor. So that's a bit of a flavor. Everyone can check it out on the link. I'll, I'll repost that in the chat, but that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. And, and thank you also for your help in pulling this event together. Tom's been the champion for us today. Uh, we will be taking the learnings from this event and from that jam board into defining a bit of a London Climate Action Week community roadmap going forward. But let's give the last word now over to Nick Maybe, um, the CEO of E3G, to summarize where we're seeing the roadmap emerge over the next year. Nick, over to you. Um, thanks, Alex. And I'm also, I chair the, the London Climate Action Week steering group. So um, it's been great to hear this and, and think about what that means for next year's London Climate Action Week. I suppose as a reflector of someone who's done this for quite a long time, it's just how different this conversation is than if we were doing this a year before the Paris Climate Agreement. There it was all about um, targets and, and, and text. Here it's all about um, ambition and action and inclusion and how do we engage on the practicalities of areas like resilience and nature-based solutions. And I think that's where... Um, you know, we are, this is a shift and this is the, what UK has got a grip is that when, you know, it's very different negotiating a bit of text to aligning billions of people on the planet to actually make a difference in the real world, which is really what this COP is about. And they've got to invent a way of doing that. And the roadmap has got to um, reflect that. So I think it's, it's brilliant. I think it's great that we've, we kind of, in a way, started that different flavor of approach where we're focusing on, in a sense, making things happen as opposed to just saying they should happen. Um, and I think that's where issues such as the one raised about finance and the UK's commitment of a live debate in the UK about aid budgets is so critical because we can't show solidarity towards other countries, even while we're showing solidarity at home. What's the basis for building this global cooperation? And I think those that's the kind of very real um, issues which we will be tackling over the next year. Um, I just want to sign off about London Climate Action Week. It was a bit um, arbitrary creating Thor themes because a lot of the other themes touched on um, the COP26 roadmap. I think the number one was the green recovery theme where we had over 70 events because I think, again, everybody says the road to COP26 goes through the green recovery. Um, we need a green recovery in London. So for those of you who are based in London, please work with our London-based groups because we need to make sure that both the UK and London itself shows that green recovery. We can't build a green recovery um, base. But also, I think the other area was whole of society, where if we're going to have permission from people to go this fast and do these radical changes, we need to bring everybody with, with us and engage everybody through everything they do, from food to fashion to sport to music to culture to art. And we'll hopefully next year have even more of those groups back. They've been some of the hardest groups hit by climate change. And still, despite some of our partners having 70% layoffs, they've still been working on the Climate Action Week from the theatricist groups and music groups. So um, moving forward next year, we're gonna have another London Climate Action Week in July. Hopefully we'll be able to do it face to face as well as digital. Um, it'll be a critical point in the year towards COP26. And we hope to bring the energy we've seen here and some of the ideas to there, but it's not just event to event. We wanna work with you through the year. So there will be some 
engagement, as Alex says, to build off this week and build demands out, but also actions out into the process. So please join us in that. There'll be, you can sign up to be part of London Climate Action Week 2021 on the site. And we'll be holding a kind of processes and meetings before Christmas to take it forward. But thanks so much for everybody's energy. Um, if we can carry this forward over the year, I think we've got a decent chance of dealing with the headwinds that Isabel's identified by um, outblowing them with our energy. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Nick, and thank you all for, for joining us. We had over 80 people on the call, so we look forward to carrying the energy of all 80 of those people forward over the next year. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.